Um, also, I want to let everyone know there will be a reception uh, immediately after this, uh, following in the DRC2 auditorium, where we'll have a chance to mingle with the speakers and talk to the company people a bit. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, Michael Dixon with Unimed. Uh, Unimed is the technology commercialization and development entity here at UNMC. So our goal is to see technologies uh, that are created in the lab developed into products that help improve healthcare. Um, we really recognize that the technology development is a long, expensive process, and so that's why we created the demo day to try to give you, uh, to give everyone a glimpse at some of the hard work and development that's going into creating the technologies of tomorrow. So it, it's a very tedious process, it's a very expensive process, and I think we've got some companies that are just doing an amazing job developing products. And these are really the, the products of the next generation. So we're, we're looking forward to seeing them develop these technologies further. Up next, uh, we have um, Ron Allen, Dr. Ron Allen from Chrysalis Medical. Uh, Chrysalis is a new venture that's formed in the heart of Silicon Valley, and uh, Ron's going to be here to talk to us about the new venture and how Chrysalis is teamed with Unimed to help bring the device to the market. So a uh, quick bio on Ron here. Before getting the uh, startup bug, uh, Ron spent uh, many years in the uh, medical device world. He spent the last uh, 10 years serving as VP of Regulatory Affairs for both Boston Scientific and Stryker Neurovascular. He and his team bring a wealth of medical device development expertise to the table, and I, I really do encourage anyone um, post this talk in the reception, talk to Ron and his team. They have a, a significant um, experience developing new medical devices, and we're really excited to be partnered with them as they start to bring some of these devices to the market. Good afternoon. My name is Ron Allen, and today's very short presentation is truly a lot of fun for me, okay? Um, as mentioned, we have our offices in San Jose. Um, the weather, I think that you guys absolutely prepared that for us today, because there is absolutely no difference in terms of sunlight, warmth, zero wind, and just sheer comfort. So thank you, whoever called that in. We greatly appreciate it. <clears throat> Today's presentation is a little bit different because our goals are different than what you may have seen historically. Our goal is to do two things going into 2015. One, reduced cost of health care in that specific area in which we are focused. And two, reduce the risk to patients. We call that disruptive medical device. What we do, we take a concept and take that concept, we review it very carefully to make sure there is reality to that concept. Then we move that concept to a medical device. Are we selective? Absolutely. You can't always be successful. But by care, very close evaluation, listening to a number of people who are very educated in the industry, we think we're going to bet properly and effectively more often than not. Today, we're going to spend just a few minutes and show you one I think you too will agree it is a very effective approach. So what will we talk about today? Real quickly, disruptive technology from our perspective, ours meaning our total team, our collaborators, our mentors, our trainers, and the physicians we work with. We're going to show you a concept and how we're going to take it to the market. We're also going to describe how the reduction in the use of catheter exchanges indeed will decrease the cost of healthcare, at least in this patient population and reduce the potential for infection, which we know for a fact, based on current and historical data, is very high. So, <clears throat> this just basically depicts a catheter, hemodialysis catheter, placed in the severe vena cava and implanted. This is a standard approach. There are various approaches, but this is approximately one-third of the positioning of hemodialysis catheters. 
Here is, as you can see, a standard catheter uh, taken apart, and you can see the, the ports of the catheter in the vessel. So let's talk about 2 million patients worldwide. 2 million. Continually. It's important to recognize that a patient on dialysis has treatments three times a week on a several hour basis. So if you could just momentarily put yourself in that position, what would that do to your schedule if you had to go sit into a dialysis center three times a week? Let's just say for three hours a day. That is a significant impact on your time. Now there's no question that you have to do that because you have no alternative, at least positive alternative. There are alternatives to not following your doctor's orders, especially in this case. 350,000 of those patients are in the U.S. It increases approximately 5 to 7 percent each year in, in terms of increased population. Those people who are in fact becoming dialysis patients. <clears throat> the majority of the patients do well as long as they, in fact, follow a very strict routine. Very strict routine. And in, <clears throat> in terms of the types of catheters being used, if you take a look at the catheters being made available around the world, you won't see really much difference in them. Materials are basically the same, same lengths, same diameters, and so on and so forth. So, what do we want to do? We want to change that. We want to change that dynamic. We want to change it quickly. <clears throat> it is a common belief that you have to exchange the catheters, replace them over time. So you have a patient who's had this catheter going through treatments on a, on a weekly basis, and that catheter may stay in that, implanted in that patient, let's say, three months. And at some point in time, that catheter gets occluded or the ports, the holes I showed you in the earlier slide, are covered. And you have to replace it, at least under the current standard of practice. So here is the issue. Here's a fibrous sheath that grows over the catheter, and I'll show that to you here real quickly. That fibrous sheath is common. It will grow over most implants, as long as they are biocompatible, they will grow over most implants that you place in the body other than articulating surfaces similar to total knee, total hip, elbow, wrist, because you're constantly working the top surfaces of those implants. Oops, wrong way. So you have to, under the current practice and the current use of the current design of catheters, you have to remove that catheter. <clears throat> you then have to take open that sheath, and right now they're using an angioplasty balloon, and I'll show that to you, and you replace that catheter with a new catheter. The current replacement is a very expensive, $18,000, and I want to be very clear on this number. The 18000 is not for the catheter. It is for the total procedure. You have to take this patient, take them to an outpatient, outpatient clinic or a surgery center or a cath lab. And you have to incorporate those people in costs and expenses to complete this transition. Now that cost may differ from one facility, uh, let's say here in Nebraska, to what may happen in California or into New York. But the cost is still the same in terms of expensive to get it squared away. The cause of the, 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 the dysfunction of the catheter is really caused by the covering of the catheter by this fibrous sheath. Let me give you an example. Here is this fibrous sheath that I'm speaking of. This is the catheter. You can see it in both locations. And here is the port that has been, the sheath has been peeled back over the port. So you can just barely see the port in this particular uh, graphic. Somehow, we have to maintain the catheter 
and open the sheath without removing the catheter. So far, so good? So this is what's been tried. Here's a standard catheter. Here's the angio angioplasty balloon or angiography balloon. Uh, this balloon, as you can see, has already been opened and they're using a normal saline uh, in this particular case. The balloon, as you can see, the fingers that give you some uh, sizing type of uh, phenomenon. So let me show you how this is used. Here's a case. This is not one of the easiest slides to use in many cases, but I'm going to see if I can uh, point it out to you. Here's a catheter placed in the superior vena cava. It comes down, and you can just see the sheath, or better, you can see the arrow which points to the tip of the catheter. This right here is the actual fibrin sheath with a die in its sac. If you move over to the B slide, what they've basically done here is they've moved the catheter. They've placed in a guide wire. This is the guide wire, maintaining the same location. This is the tip of the catheter, which has been pulled back. They've then taken that angiography balloon, placed it over the guide wire, entering here. You can just see the tip of the catheter right here. This is the angiography balloon uh, catheter. Here's a tip of the balloon right here. And this sac that you see here has been filled with the radiographic dye. After they've opened the balloon, after they've opened the space, here's the same catheter. They remove the guide wire. You can see they put a, the catheter back in place. You can see now that dye is all the way throughout. They've opened that fibrin sheath. They didn't remove the catheter, but they didn't pull it back. So what are we talking about here? What we're talking about is doing something a little bit different. The, the uh, use of the angiography balloon from a regulatory perspective, that being the FDA, that balloon is not indicated or approved FDA-wise for that particular use. For that particular use. There's a lot of uses for that balloon, but that's not one of the approved ones. So what are we going to do? What we've basically done <clears throat> did is come here to the university, work with Dr. Florescu, and his design, the concept he, he had after we vetted that all out, and I mean we spent some hours in the workshop looking at this, it was perfect. It was perfect for two reasons. It combines the already known uh, indication and how to use that balloon along with saving the need to change the catheter. That's a very big deal because each time you can prevent from having to exchange the catheter, you can reduce the impact on the patient. You can keep the patient's treatment program going consistently and continually without having to take them back to a surgical suite. So, it provides a solution very quickly. When we get this product to the market and we are running quickly to get there, uh, following all the guidelines and all the processes, full validation and what have you, the patient will not need to leave the dialysis center in order to open this catheter and allow the patient to continue to receive proper treatment and continual treatment without having to go to the surgical center. It's a big deal. Also, we're going to reduce many of the risks that are incumbent in terms of having additional surgical procedures, not to mention infection. The initial animal study is very, very positive. We have additional animal studies we've just completed and planned and following those, and currently we're working with the FDA and, and the European Union notified body, uh, we think we're going to be ready to go. So our initial, I think I've got that in the slide, 
So we have a clearly a regulatory, we have a clear regulatory path after spending a number of years working in the regulatory area. The first place I went was the FDA. Had a cup of coffee. I had to pay for it, by the way. Uh, sat down, had a very meaningful discussion, and um, they gave us pretty good guidance as to how to proceed. Very happy about that. This is this catheter is not for sale. I need to mention that because we're in a public setting. We're making no offers to sell the product. It's not available for sale today. Uh, we're not trying to market in any shape or manner or form. Just want to get that disclosure out. So, simply, very simply, um, here's a standard catheter that we showed you, and we're going to put a balloon at the tip of it right into here. And when that catheter is, when the patient needs to have the sheath uh, opened, we're going to inflate this balloon right here. It's going to break that sheath, and we're going to keep right on rolling. No need to, no need to bring the patient out. There's no embolic uh, debris floating upstream or downstream, however you're looking at it. Very first thing we took a look at was that. Um, working with Unimet, I'm not going to take you through each one of these slides, but it's been phenomenal for us. I've got to tell you, I've been in this industry a long time, worked with a lot of universities and a ton of physicians in terms of uh, new product development designs. This has been phenomenal. I won't go much further than that. I'm running out of time. Um, we have a business model. I won't go through it for the sake of time. But I'll be glad to answer any questions that you may have at this time. Yes, sir. That's what we're thinking as well, because in the Dallas Center, they're 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 tracking the flow on a moment by moment basis and they're tracking the history of these patients. We believe that you can open that and maintain that flow as opposed to allowing it to occlude and then do something about it. Absolutely. Additional questions? Yes, sir. <laughs> Can I get, okay, I'll go through it. Thank you. Thank you for that question. That gave me a couple more minutes. Um, there is a global catheter use. It's about 2 million patients. Um, in the U.S., about 350,000. These numbers, I might add, came from NIH and FDA. So we, we trust that they're correct. When we check different hospitals around the country, that, they all sort of fit. <clears throat> the replacement market, the replacement per year is about 14 to 36 percent, given the area that you may be in. So we're saying 49,000 to 126,000 patients in that field, only looking at replacement, not looking at it as a primary. So at an average cost of $400 per catheter, which I think here at the university is around 350, 400, and we checked six different hospitals, and it's in that range in terms of cost per catheter. Uh, the numbers are pretty significant. When we take a look and we say that the market growth is 25 to 30% based off of what's been happening historically for the last 10 years, when you're looking for 15% of the market in terms of a five-year plan, dollars get to be pretty straightforward. Um, the one thing that we are thinking of, and as we're showing here, we're only looking at the replacement market. We haven't even expanded our concept of saying we're going to go after all of the catheters. If it's functional and it works and it's the best thing for the patient, it lowers the cost. If it meets the goals that we've established for ourselves and meeting the requirements for the hospital, we don't need to worry about how big that market is. It will come to us in terms of being able to, to meet it. Additional questions? Thank you very much. Thank you for the question on the bottom. <laughs>